Good morning. My name is Mitch Myers. I'm with the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. It is August 26th, 2022, and it is my honor and privilege to introduce Howie Watt. Hello, Howie. Hi, Mitch. I'm going to ask a few questions for Dallas Jewish Historical Society. You ready to roll? I'm ready. All right. Well, tell us your full name. Howard Emil, spelled E-M-I-L, Watt, W-A-T-T. And when were you born? I was born July 14th of 1947. And uh, tell us why, with such an unusual middle name, why your parents named you that and, and the rest of you. Sure, sure. So, uh, interesting story. Uh, back when I was uh, about to be born, uh, no sonography. And the way a pregnant woman carried a child, they thought they understood uh, where your, uh, you know, what, what your gender was going to be. So they were convinced I was going to be a girl. I was being named after one great grandfather whose name was Heschel. And, uh, and so my name was going to be Helen. Uh, I, uh, 7.30 in the morning, out pops a boy, uh, to the surprise of my parents. About 7.30 that evening, my dad's best friend came to the hospital to, to meet me, to see how my parents were doing, uh, and uh, went to the nursery with my dad, went back to the room. My mom said, George, my dad's name, uh, why don't you guys go out to dinner? Uh, you know, maybe we'll come up with a name, <laughs> because he's a boy that starts with an age after that. So as the story goes, my father and his best friends went out. Friend went out to dinner. Uh, they were outside the restaurant after dinner, smoking a cigarette. And my father says to his friend, "What are we going to call him?" And my father's friend looks up at the sign and says, "There it is, George. They had eaten dinner at Howard Johnson's." <laughs> and so that's where my first name came from. My middle name came from my. Uh, uh, paternal grandmother's father, whose name was Emil. Very nice. All right. And your nickname? Howie. Okay. And, and how'd that be, become bestowed upon you? Um, for some reason, my my grandparents started calling me Howie. Uh, and in fact, my grandfather named me Chief. Uh, and it was Chief Pachentukas. And uh, to this day, my cousins, my siblings uh, call me chief, and as I get to know people real well, uh, you know, I ask that they either call me Howie or chief. Very nice. Well, let's, let's keep rolling, Chief. Okay. So tell us where you were born. Born in Brooklyn, New York, uh, and uh, lived there until I was seven, uh, lived in a Jewish neighborhood off of Kings Highway, uh, which is an area of Brooklyn, near Brooklyn College. Uh, we uh, lived there in a second floor apartment uh, until uh, I was seven, which time we moved out to Long Island, which was the upwardly mobile place for, Ju for Jewish people, uh, just as Brooklyn was the upwardly mobile uh, place that people from the Lower East Side uh, came from. Interesting. And where is your family from, your parents, grandparents? So interestingly and, and uh, unusual uh, for my generation, all four of my grandparents were born in New York. Uh, and all four of their, uh, all eight of their parents came from uh, either Eastern Europe or my mother's father his family came in the 1860s from Germany, the Lowensteins. That would be the great-grandparents. Great-grandparents. Nice. And uh, we'll describe a little bit about your parents or grandparents, their personalities and what sure. was going on in Brooklyn and Long Island. And sure. Stuff. So um, uh, my grandparents all came from Orthodox families, but all, for whatever reason, uh, were very assimilated. Uh, so all, both my parents were Jewish, all four of my grandparents were Jewish, 
but I grew up in a Jewish world uh, with my grandparents where none of them uh, belonged to a synagogue. Uh, and uh, my main connection with my grandparents were my father's parents who, uh, for a number of reasons, including I was the oldest grandchild, uh, became an important part of my life. Um, uh, I, uh, uh, none of my grandparents belonged to a synagogue, uh, although uh, my grandfather was a bar mitzvah, uh, my father was a bar mitzvah, uh, and our family, when we moved to Long Island, joined a conservative synagogue. Uh, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, do you have siblings? So I have uh, uh, a sister born of the same parents. My parents divorced when I was 14. My father uh, married again. Uh, and my uh, two brothers uh, became my half-brothers because their father had died. And my father adopted them. Uh, and then my father and stepmother adopted a child pretty late in life. So I have uh, uh, a fully blooded sister, uh, two half brothers, uh, uh, and then by adoption uh, adopted my other sister. Uh, and so, you know, depending on how you look at it, I either have one sister or in my my worldview, have four siblings. Tell me their name. So my closest sibling, my brother Jeff uh, Watt, uh, grew up in Dallas. Uh, well, actually went to high school. He went to Thomas Jefferson High School and his last two years uh, went to W.T. White. Um, uh, he and I were real close. He died tragically at 52 in the year 2000. Uh, my other half-brother, Mike, um, lives in Arizona. Uh, and my sister, Marion, who's my full-blooded sister, lives in uh, Highland Village. And then my youngest sibling, Melissa, lives in uh, Dallas. Very nice. Uh, so went to Sawmill Road Elementary School. I know I went to PS 199 in Brooklyn in kindergarten and the first grade. Uh, and then when we moved to Long Island, I was uh, I must have been I must have just turned eight because I entered second grade. Uh, went to elementary school at a school called Sawmill Road. Uh, then went to Jerusalem Avenue Junior High School, then to W.C. Mepham uh, High School, and uh, and uh, yeah, that, that's my public school education. So tell me a little bit about the activities that you were doing, athletics, education, sure. Jewish affiliations at this time sure. during this formative year. So um, uh, Went to Hebrew school three days a week, belonged to a conservative synagogue, and, uh, you know, wasn't particularly uh, a fun activity. Uh, uh, you know, it was, it was what it was. Uh, I was like a lot of other kids of the era, I was a sports junkie. Either I was watching it or playing it. So uh, on weekends, I'd take my duffel bag, like every other kid. I'd put my baseball bat, my softball bat, my hardball bat, my glove, my basketball, my football. My mother would give me a dollar. Uh, and, you know, was, the only instruction was be home by dark. And so, uh, you know, probably not unusual. You know, lived in an era in a world where, you know, you could trust your 9, 10, 11 year old kid just to disappear for the day and come back. And uh, uh, like I said, went to Hebrew school, had a bar mitzvah. Um, 
there's somewhat of an unusual uh, Jewish growing up years in that uh, my sister was not expected to go to Hebrew school, uh, did not have a bat mitzvah, um, and uh, nothing much was expected of me other than to have a bar mitzvah. Um, and uh, just normal kid, you know, pretty good student growing up. Uh, there was an exam at the end of the sixth grade for kids in New York at the time, and you were put in one of three curriculum. I was put in what's called the advanced curriculum, which was about 10% of the kids uh, for junior high school. Uh, something unusual is that my family was so assimilated that until I uh, went to high school, uh, we didn't have seders. Uh, Hanukkah for that generation was you light the candles, you got one gift, uh, but really didn't celebrate any other Jewish holidays. And it wasn't, like I said, until I was 16 that I ever went to a seder. And the reason for that was that my best buddy starting in high school was Orthodox and got invited to a Seder the first couple of nights. Uh, and uh, so there was not expected much of me Jewishly. Um, and, and part of the reason, and I'm not sure how many other people have done, uh, you know, this, what I'm doing, we're from New York, but in New York, and looking back, uh, our neighborhood was all Jewish. It was significantly assimilated Jews. There was only one Orthodox family in the neighborhood. <coughs> Excuse me. Not something uh, that I realized until I moved to Dallas, that if you grew up uh, in New York and were Jewish, you could be Jewish without really having uh, uh, a lot of uh, time spent thinking about your being Jewish. You could be Jewish and, you know, the only kind of, not traumatic, but the only life-changing experience about being Jewish in New York was when I was five and uh, played, had, had a friend in the apartment complex that I lived in and uh, one day we were playing and he asked me if I was Jewish and I said, uh, I think I'm Jewish. And so I went home and said that my friend Paul uh, had asked me if I was Jewish, and I said, we're Jewish, right? And my parents said, of course we're Jewish. And so, I'm not sure it was a day later or a week later, he and I are playing on the playground, and he said, my parents wondered if you were Jewish, because your last name is Watt, which isn't a Jewish name. And so, I remember running home uh, at the end of uh, playing with my friend, and I was crying, uh, and I said, uh, are we Jewish, are we really Jewish? Because my friend Paul said, with the name Watt, you really couldn't be Jewish. And before my parents could answer, I said, why didn't we have uh, a Jewish name like Applebaum? And my parents said, no, that was our name. And so that was my only experience in childhood where being Jewish really was a question that I didn't know the answer to or had to think about being Jewish. Yeah. And it wasn't really until I moved to Dallas when I was 17 that I realized that uh, being Jewish was something that you had to think about consciously uh, and really uh, had a life choice. So tell me some of your friends, your close friends while you were growing up, and you, you mentioned Paul in elementary and junior high school, and so, through your bar, bar mitzvah. So my friends uh, were all Jewish. Uh, there was Billy Lerner and Andy Schiffman 
and uh, Michael Schiffman, his brother, and Stevie Koshers, uh, people who went on to become either accountants or lawyers or doctors. And so, um, uh, in fact, I lived in a world, interestingly, uh, Mitch, where um, uh, I, I grew up in a neighborhood and went to a school where 90% of the people were either Jewish or Catholic. And intellectually, I understood that 70% of the country was Protestant. I just didn't know anybody until I moved to Dallas uh, well enough uh, who was Protestant to be in their home. So I had this intellectual understanding, I just didn't know those other people. Do you keep up with the, the same friends you just mentioned, or you know where they are? Um, minimally, minimally. Uh, in fact, I had an interesting uh, situation where my best friend in high school, Alan Smithline, who was Jewish, Orthodox, um, uh, was a professional museum. He lived in Boulder, then he lived in uh, Berkeley in California. And I had, uh, you know, we'd talk every six months, but his world was different than my world. Uh, at age 74, he's still trying to make it as a professional mu musician. And so, never had a wife. Never had kids, had many, many girlfriends until he turned 40, and, and the women he met wanted not only somebody who was cool, but somebody who could make a living. And so I uh, went out there for another friend's um, friend I've made since then to his 70th birthday, spent a couple of days with my friend Alan, and for whatever reason, the connection was really gone. Since then, I've tried to call him a number of times. He's never responded to my phone calls. And uh, in fact, reading the Texas Jewish Post uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and one of the rabbis that writes a column, and he talked about Jewish traits in this time of the year when we, uh, uh, you know, study different scriptures, and he talked about friendship. And uh, I realized, and that relates to love, and two types of love, love that has a connection to it, uh, that there's, a, there's a, uh, a reason that you love somebody, and then there's unconditional love, and how those can, can kind of, love with a condition can become unconditional love, and unconditional love can, can can end up being love that ends up with a condition. And he mentions childhood friendships that don't last. And I finally came to terms with my best friend in high school. And for some reason, we lost the connection and he no longer needed to be my friend. And coming to grips that that was okay. So, uh, um, you know, and so, in fact, interestingly, this morning, before I came down from Denton, uh, I reread that column, and I had a higher level of peace with my friend Alan Smithline, and it was okay that he was not reconnecting with me like I wanted the connection to last forever, I guess. Well, that's a good learning experience. Yes. So uh, let's put in perspective uh, what's going on in, around you in world events and uh, by the time you're, you know, in your high school years before you moved to Dallas, what, what world events are impacting you or shaping your life that you can talk about a little bit? Sure. Kind of put in perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up and I can't fully explain it, one of those people that was optimistic and I became attracted to politics when I was, um, let's see, he would have ran for president right before my 14th birthday, after my 14th birthday, so I became a guy who door to door handed out literature for John Kennedy. Uh, and um, so Mr. Optimism to this day, as I oftentimes say, despite what I know about the world, 
I'm still an optimist. And um, so, uh, importantly, something happened during those years around my bar mitzvah is that my parents' relationship was growing uh, weaker and weaker, and my parents uh, divorced when I was 14. And so I went into a period of life where um, I became depressed. Uh, back before we knew about drugs, uh, prescription drugs and counseling. So I spent uh, probably years at 13, right before the divorce, 14 and 15, where I went from a very popular, got invited to all the parties, to somebody who retreated, uh, really didn't have any friends, was depressed without knowing I was depressed. Uh, my father moved to Dallas. My mother uh, had to concentrate on figuring out a way of making a living. She had her own depression, deep depression, uh, and um, lived a life that began to change when I was a sophomore in high school uh, and found a new group of friends including Alan Smithline, and my two other good buddies were um, uh, Artie Levine uh, and uh, Lenny Berlin and Alan Smithline. And uh, so, you know, high school graduation was no big deal. Uh, and significantly because my paternal grandparents, when I was a younger child, uh, my grandfather, a paternal grandfather, believe it or not, was one of six brothers uh, born in the late 19th, uh, 1890s. My grandfather was born on an interesting day, January 1st of 1900. Uh, and his siblings, he was only one of five brothers, uh, six brothers, uh, who didn't have a college degree. And so, uh, for whatever reason, Education was a big deal to my great-grandparents. They managed to put all six of their sons, uh, except for my grandfather, uh, and he didn't go to college, as the story goes, uh, because he, he was a gifted high school athlete, played on the first, played in the first New York City high school basketball championship game. And, uh, and uh, uh, was a good baseball player. Had he was asked to sign a professional contract, his mother, who is a, you know a nice Jewish mother, forbid him from uh, from signing a contract. So he ended up rebelling by being the only one of the the boys who didn't go to college. That was his way of getting back and his parents um, got married real young to my grandmother, who was 15, and he decided, knowing how well his brothers did, that his grandchildren would be educated. So before I ever went to elementary school, I could uh, add, subtract, multiply, divide. I could read before I even started kindergarten. And it start. And I got a good head start, go. which I think served me well. Great. So now you've moved to Dallas. Right. Uh, you've graduated co uh, uh, high school from where? From W.C. Mifflin High School in Long Island. Okay. Uh, so after your graduation, you moved to Dallas? Yes. Okay. I thought you 17. I mean, a lot of people graduated at 18. Yeah, I graduated 17. Uh, uh, my parents were divorced. My dad said he would pay for college. If I moved to Texas, okay. so I moved to Texas. And where did you go to college? So I was enrolled to go to University of Texas at Austin. My dad had his fourth or fifth heart attack, and my recollection is he guilt tripped me to applying to SMU, which I had no no thought of going to to college, and I ended up. Uh, getting accepted the summer 
before college at SMU and enrolled at SMU. So tell us a little bit about your years at SMU in college and how it's like to be at a Methodist college and as a Jewish young man. So, um, so uh, before talking about that, tell you how naive I was and how I was entering into a different world. Spent the night, uh, you know, went to my dad's from the airport. Um, the next day, he decided to drive me around Dallas. Uh, we were in downtown Dallas. Uh, we were at a red light, and I looked up, and to my right was a church that took up a whole city block. And I said, look, Dad, there's the first, me thinking it was the first ever, Baptist church. And he looked at me and he said, Howie, don't ever say that again. <laughs> That's a denomination of one of the branches of being a Protestant, is being part of the first Baptist church. So that was not the first ever Baptist church. That was the first Baptist church of Dallas, which happened to be a very, uh, you know, dominating religious institution in Dallas at the time and to this day. So I went to SMU where um, living in the dorm uh, and before I uh, met any other Jewish people uh, realized that uh, that everybody was a Protestant uh, and at least I thought they were. Uh, There's a Jewish fraternity, Sigma Alpha Mu, which was there until uh, 1975. Uh, Wanting a Jewish connection, uh, I joined the Jewish fraternity Sigma Alpha Mu. And what did you study? What were your uh, majors in, and what were you so, thinking about? Uh, I was thinking about being pre-med, um, but two things happened. One is uh, I was more I was I was the oldest of the kids. I had I was the one that was always good that never made any mistakes. And I'm off at college and learned about beer. So my first semester, I had a 2.2, uh, which meant I had four C's and a B. Uh, and um, uh, had joined the Jewish fraternity and was very social, very glad I found other Jewish people. And. Uh, then I think it was my third semester, after I had a good second and third semester, that I took organic chemistry. Worked harder at organic chemistry than any other class I ever took, I think in college or law school, and made a C, and was happy that I made a C. But also remember the professor who knew I was pre-med saying, you probably need to find something else. And so, um, I got into the business school and became an accounting major. And did you graduate with uh, business? Graduated degree? with a degree in accounting from SMU in 1969. Uh, what what happened at that point, as far as my education, uh, was that uh, we were thick into the Vietnam War in the spring of 1969. I took my uh, physical, I passed the physical, and um, for grins, uh, took the GRE, which I did pretty well in, took the LSAT, which I did pretty well in, uh, did not want to uh, uh, go into the Army. Uh, my brother, uh, who's a year younger than me, Jeff, uh, had gone to Henderson County Junior College, he'd gone to uh, UNT. Every semester he had to leave college because he never went to class and ended up getting drafted. And so my brother Jeff said, you don't want to be in the military. He was about to be sent off to Vietnam. And so I uh, realized even though I had no clue about what I want to do in my life, uh, realized that the summer of 69, they still had graduate deferments, 
So I applied to graduate schools, applied to law school, got accepted to uh, SMU Law School, uh, was about to, uh, oh, no, that's right, SMU Law School didn't start till the fall, so I would have been drafted, looked around, and SM, at UT Austin, uh, which is a good school, had me on their waiting list, so I called them up and they said, it's a coincidence, more than a coincidence maybe that you called, because somebody just decided not to go to UT, and would you like to start summer school at UT Law School, um, but you have to be down in Austin in five days. And so um, I decided to, to go to law school, and it wasn't until my friend Mark Shore, who had transferred from SMU and graduated from, well, I guess he was a senior uh, at SMU, said, why don't you come down here? I know somebody that needs a roommate. Um, and uh, started law school at SMU. In the meantime... SMU or UT Austin? I mean UT Austin. Okay. UT Austin. Uh, in the meantime, I found the National Guard unit, and uh, but went to summer school at UT Law School. Fabulous. Let me just back up one second because sure. I gotta ask this question. You're sure. at SMU, it's 1969. Right. You're watching Chuck Hickson and Jerry Levise and Hayden Fry, right, roll through uh, most exciting period of their time, I guess. And Jerry Levias, tell us a little bit about that. Were you interested in the football? Was sure. That Not only was I interested in football, but I was manager of the football team at SMU during my freshman and sophomore years. So I became to be good friends with Jerry Levias, and uh, uh, he was a real smart guy. And Jerry, on a couple occasions, would take me down to student union to pick up his mail and he got hate mail he also got cash in the mail and so went to his room and I'd help him open the envelopes and I opened a couple of the hate letters I would read them to them he said we're taking those to coach Fry Hayden Fry and the money no one knows about but you and me and so he would literally get probably a hundred, a couple hundred. Uh, I think the second time we did it, I think he had $500 in cash in the mail. And nobody's known about that until right now, is that <laughs> uh, Just my closest friends. <laughs> and uh, now uh, my grandkids, the Jewish Historical Society, and other people. Um, that's great, that's a great story. Um, so tell me a little bit, you know, how the Vietnam War is shaping your politics and shaping your identity a little bit. Sure. We touch on that and then we'll go to past law school. And sure. So I went to uh, SMU, which was very conservative in school. Uh, while I was at SMU, there were no Vietnam protests. The biggest protests were to protest uh, men in the dormitory having hours because my freshman year you had to be back in the dorm at 10 o'clock during the week and at midnight on the weekends and so those were the big protests not about Vietnam uh, it wasn't until I moved to Austin that I became more politically involved because at, at, at UT you couldn't help but uh, get involved in one way or another in, in your politics about the Vietnam War. And tell us a little bit about that, how that sure. affected you. Uh, I was affected because of my political leanings, uh, because of, um, of where I went to school, UT, uh, and because of my brother uh, writing me these letters from Vietnam talking about the horror of, of being there uh, how the war was so stupid, and about his and, and most of his fellow soldiers' goals were just to come to protect, take care of each other, and to come home alive. So uh, now you've gone to law school, you've graduated, 
uh, next steps in your career? What are you thinking and what did you do? So um, I graduated from UT Law School, got a job with the State Securities Board, uh, where I worked for a year and a half, uh, still not knowing what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, I uh, was in a very toxic relationship, although I ended up marrying the person, my first wife, uh, and uh, ended up not liking my job and uh, deciding that I needed to leave. When I left, um, my first cousin I grew up with in Brooklyn, Robert Singer, said, why don't you come stay with he and his, his wife? And um, until I figured out what I wanted to do, on the ride up there, I decided I wanted to let my hair grow long, because I'd been in the National Guard, was about to get out, serving six years, uh, buy a Volkswagen bus, let my hair grow long, and travel around the country in my Volkswagen bus while I pondered my future. I was there about three weeks, my dad, who my cousin worked for, transferred him to, um, to uh, San Antonio, and I found myself alone, although I was about to discover that a good friend of mine from SMU and then UT, Mark Shore, lived in Denton, and I decided to hang out in Denton for a while. Excellent. And so, tell us a little bit more about, you know, what, when you finally decided to uh, I guess with a law degree when you became a lawyer, Yes. actually working in for a law firm. So I uh, found Mark, who we both know, uh, and to this day is one of my two best friends in the world, um, and decided I liked Denton. Denton was in Austin, but it was in a lot of ways very similar. Um, very liberal. Um, and uh, so I went into private practice, um, had a uh, not so successful first year. I uh, grossed $5,700 as a lawyer, but I left a, led a very minimalist lifestyle, um, was a hippie without long hair, and, um, and ended up, uh, without trying, uh, got a job in the district attorney's office and um, decided Denton fit my personality, gave up the dream of traveling in the Volkswagen bus and decided that, uh, at least for the time being, I was going to live in Denton. Very nice. Now, what year is this you started your... I, 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 I moved... I, we were supposed to move to Denton on December 31st, 1974. Um, ended up start, stopping off at a party, drank too much alcohol. They wouldn't let me drive to Denton that night, so I ended up moving to Denton in 75, even though it was January 1st instead of 74. Uh, went to work for the DA's office in February of 1976. Um, like the job, uh, it gave me real world experience. Realized that I might want to be be a lawyer, uh, and uh, through circumstance and coincidence and good fortune, uh, there was a position open to become Denton's municipal judge, which I applied for in uh, June of 1976 ended up uh, becoming Denton's municipal judge, where I served for eight and a half years. So, a couple things. Who was the DA at the time you are working for the district attorney? Uh, somebody named John Lawhon, and um, I, I guess I need to tell the story for history's sake, but John had seen me around the courthouse, thought I was a nice young man, and said, there's only one question I have to ask you before you have the job, have you ever smoked marijuana? So I looked him straight in the eye and said, no, sir, which was not a truthful answer. But he said, I believe you. 
you've got the job. <laughs> Lawyers do not lie. What are we, what are we saying here? How <laughs> I guess lawyers are like everybody else. We lie. <laughs> well, you're a hippie at heart, so it's I was a hippie at heart, so it was expected. <laughs> okay. That's great. And, and I was friends with Mark Shore. And you're friends with Mark Shore. So tell me a little bit about the legal legals and their district attorney's office. There's got to be some people that it, or, that you got along with or didn't get along with that are interesting. Yeah, it was it was interesting because I was assigned to the assi the assistant. To the district attorney at the time, 19, February 1976, there were only five attorneys that worked in the district attorney's office. I think now they have 75. Uh, and so, uh, among the memorable, memorable things was on my first day, I was trained by a guy named Freddie Marsh, and Freddie was a lifelong prosecutor. And the first day of training, he looks at me and he says, um, first thing you need to know is that probation is for innocent people. And, uh, and so I became the, a misdemeanor prosecutor, did all the child, children related stuff, like the child welfare cases, the juvenile, ca juvenile cases, the child support cases, and that led to my ultimate uh, becoming a family law specialist. Um, uh, so um, I stayed there until I became a municipal judge, which took about 60% of my time. Uh, I think of all the things I've done in law, the thing that I enjoy the most was being Denton's municipal judge. Interesting. You, you use the word applied. So can you tell us that process uh, sure. applied for a municipal uh, judge? Yeah, so being a municipal judge without an elected position, uh, you uh, uh, got appointed annually by the city council. Your hiring or firing was at you know, the whim of the city council. Uh, learned how to be a political type person. Learned what I needed to do uh, to get reappointed, I think because I was idealistic uh, and wanted to do a good job, uh, it became something that, and I was 29 when I became Denton's Municipal job, Judge, which was um, uh, pretty young, um, and, uh, but it was the job that I, as in law, that wasn't necessarily lucrative, but I've always been very idealistic and uh, I think that uh, it's something that I did a good job. So there were, I think, nine other candidates, uh, two of whom became district judges. Uh, but I think the reason I, could, I re reason I did the job, I interviewed well, and I was in, still involved in sports. I played softball, and I played basketball in the A-League, and in softball, one of my teammates was one of the Catholic priests, and in basketball, uh, one of my teammates was the Episcopalian priest in town, and so that that Pre didn't references work. good references. <laughs> okay, so let's move um, a little bit now into family. Um, is your mom and dad still alive at this point? My your judge? mom and dad, yes. Okay. My my uh, they both came to see me. Were very proud of me, uh, uh, and uh, uh, they both died at age 76. I'm 75, so I have, I'm glad I'm doing this now, we even though I'm in great health. Uh, so are you married, children? Yes, Tell us yes. a little bit about your family. So I uh, got married, uh, had a very unsuccessful marriage, um, uh, was uh, separated and divorced four years later, which ended up being a real important time of my life because um, my good friend Mark Shore, who I mentioned, suggested I go to counseling. Um, I went to counseling. One of his professors in his PhD program uh, was a guy named Byron Medler. Uh, Byron um, was very influential. Uh, 
and, and I've never had a mentor, which is something we may end up talking about, but had guides. One of my guides was Byron, who said, let me get this straight. You're 33 years old, uh, you have no baggage, you've got a professional career, uh, you've got a pretty good personality, you can define who you are and what you become. So it got me to be thinking what was important in my life. Judaism had not been an important part of my life. He said, choose three things that are non-negotiable because even though you say you'll never get married again, you're going to get married again. Uh, so uh, one of the things I chose uh, after some reflection was to be more involved in, in Judaism, which led me to my Jewish life that I wanted to get married to somebody who was Jewish, I wanted to have children, uh, which was the second of my priorities, uh, and uh, was a life-changing event. Um, and so one of my guides in, in my Jewishness, once again, was Mark Shore, who had Judaism was an important part of his life, and it's become an important part of my life, and I'd like to talk about. It. Sure. Before we go there, what's sure. the third three? Uh, number three was I wanted to uh, uh, understood that getting married and having kids was uh, going to mean that my needs were going to be important, but I wanted to marry somebody who had a similar worldview that what you did with your life was as important uh, as what your career was. And then, uh, so tell us a little bit about the Judaism and, uh, you know, how you came to uh, help uh, found a synagogue. And right, so right. Could, so, you know, be, being idealistic, I got involved in Big Brothers Big Sisters, I served on the board and as president, got involved in the Denton Food Bank, uh, which is something I was a longtime member of and, and chair. Uh, uh, the um, uh, Denton uh, Advocacy Center, which I was uh, a longtime board member and president of. Uh, and then I got involved in Jewish causes. I was uh, a, uh, a founding member uh, in uh, Congregation Colomy in Flower Mound. Uh, I got involved in Hillel in North Texas, which ended up becoming part of the Hillels in North Texas, which, which I was a long -term time uh, member of uh, and, and chair of. Um, I got involved in in uh, Jewish Education Committee uh, of the JCC, um, and uh, uh, my wife and I helped underwrite uh, the Jewish Studies program at the University of North Texas, and um, and all things which became an important part of my identity and what my priorities were. It's fabulous. All of that is great. And uh, you really fulfilled that first part of the threes, right? The Judaism, and you're still working on that as well. Very involved. Oh, also, I, uh, at age 55, decided that, um, and I, um, I'm i trying to think what the, the program is at the J uh, for people, the Melton program. I was involved in the Melton program for two years. That wasn't enough for me. and. So I ended up going to Spurs Institute of Jewish Studies in Chicago, where after six years of study, I got my master's in Jewish Studies. Fabulous. Fabulous. Uh, so the second part of that is married. Tell yes. us your wife's name. My wife's Maggie, uh, who could, uh, was a convert to Judaism. So I fell in love and realized that an important thing was, because she already had two children, and had grown up in a, in a Protestant background. And so early on realizing that 
there was something special about the relationship. Uh, you know, said that this was something important to me. She ended up studying under Rabbi uh, Feinstein uh, at Sheriff Israel, and uh, uh, we ended up getting married at Sheriff Israel. My wife adopted Judaism, became involved herself in our synagogue. Uh, we raised our children as Jewish, and uh, uh, so uh, happily married 38 years later. Congratulations. Tell us your children's name. Uh, children are Lance, Jacob, and Sarah. Lance lives in California. Uh, Jacob, uh, and he's in the solar energy business. Uh, Jacob uh, works for Lockheed Martin, where he is uh, an aerospace engineer. And I proudly can say that I'm a father of a rocket scientist. And Sarah, who lives in Portland, Oregon, and is engaged to be married. Mazdaf. Any grandchildren? I have three grandchildren. Um, uh, Abigail, who's 18, and is about to start uh, North Texas College. Uh, and uh, Samuel, who's uh, a junior in high school and goes to Flower Mount High School. And Alana, who's three, and lives with Jacob and our daughter-in-law, Heather, uh, live in North Virgin Hills. Very nice, very nice. And uh, no great-grandchildren. Uh, actually, uh, Maggie is an older child, Pam, who lives in Florida, and uh, have a great-grandchild who's 11 years old. There you go. And so... That's great. That's fantastic. Um, so I know you get to see your grandchildren all the time because they're here. Do you get to see your great grandchild, or you not? Uh, not well. Uh, we're not that close with Maggie's oldest daughter. Every couple of years, we bring Janiah uh, to Texas, and and uh, I hope that she, after she graduates from high school, uh, comes to Texas, and we get to spend more time with. Fantastic. So tell us, what do you like to do for fun? Um, I, um, what do I like to do for fun? Sports junkie. Um, very active in sports myself to the extent that, that I work out with a trainer twice a week and have some buddies that on weekends we walk two and a half, uh, two to two and a half miles, try to put in 10,000 steps a day. Uh, although my wife won't believe it, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm a big follower of the Stars and the Rangers and the Mavericks and, and uh, my two college teams, uh, SMU and UT, and, uh, you know, so uh, as you know, in today's world and the world of ESPN, um, uh, interestingly, just a footnote, is my sister, who's a real sports junkie. Back in New York, as kids growing up, we listened to somebody who went on to become Jewish, who became very big in the world of sports, on uh, uh, WABC, listened to Howard Cosell's 12-minute radio program every evening. Loved Howard Cosell. And Howard Enjoyed Cosell, it. and the program was called Howard Cosell Speaking of Sports. Oh, nice. So, um, just a couple of more things on your professions. Uh, you've become, you're in real estate also. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. If you want to share some Yeah, things? sure, sure. In 1997, I had a friend who was a realtor who said, on Ryan Road in Denton, I could buy 53 acres. Uh, had no intention of getting involved. Could buy it below market value to somebody that wanted to sell it, and so I bought 53 acres, ended up developing that, and now have become a developer in the Cedar Creek Lake area, um, in, uh, in Maybank, Texas, and uh, involved in two projects as we speak, and, uh, and still involved with that, still part-time lawyer, 
And uh, although that's become increasingly difficult, and my motivation is idealistic, I'm a little bit to make money, but love to help people. And you know, when I first practiced law, everybody signed said attorney and counselor of law. So enjoy counseling people in the legal problems, but see that in a bigger perspective. So work about 10 hours a week as a lawyer involved in, in, in real estate development. Fabulous. Um, so just a couple more questions. Um, looking back, how is the world different today than during the early years growing up and, you know, just from your yeah, perspective? So, um, you know, I grew up in uh, New York City, moved to Long Island. I did not, not have central air conditioning and lived in a world where your front door was open, your screen door was locked, and you felt totally safe. Um, the New York that I left in 1965 was becoming increasingly more dangerous. Moved to Dallas, Texas before there was an LBJ freeway even. Uh, knew that it was Farmer's Branch because you could look across the hole in the ground that was become LBJ and there were farms uh, where you could understand why it was the Louisville fighting farmers. Um, and unfortunately, to some extent, uh, in, anyway, I, I lived in, in, in Brooklyn, then Long Island, then Dallas, then Austin, then Denton, everywhere I've lived, I don't think it had anything to do with me, became financially uh, good places to live. But as I oftentimes say, um, places I've lived, the places I live now, are great for business and not so great for living, necessarily. So Dallas, I think living in Dallas is not a lot, is much like living in New York when I left New York. And that is you drive on the roads and there's road rage. Uh, you go into a store and not necessarily the greatest of service. Um, where it's more of a me too world than what can I do to help my neighbor. Is that in the last few years or is that... Been it's got increasingly worse. Yeah. Increasingly worse, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, thanks for sharing that. What uh, accomplishments are you most proud of, Ali? Um, I think, I think as I look back at my life, that I had this idealistic worldview, and I realized early on that I wanted to leave the world a better place uh, because of my life. And I tried to have that seep into every aspect of my life. And so um, I think the things I've done in my profession, the things I've done as a parent, the things I've done as a husband, as a grandparent, uh, in the organization, in the nonprofits that I've been involved in. Um, I think that what I've contributed has made a positive contribution. Um, I hope I've been a good friend to my friends. Uh, I've hoped that uh, I've been a better Jew and have helped Judaism. Uh, and so um, I look better, back at my life there's some things I wish I would have changed, but I feel proud of what I've done with my life. That's beautiful. Um, if there was one thing that you want your friends and family to remember about you, uh, I know you had mentioned your accomplishments and leaving the world a better place, but if there's one thing other than that, can you uh, maybe expand on that? I made them laugh. I made them laugh when I can take my friends like Mark Shore and Seth Myers and Mitch Myers and put a smile on their face. Guys who are funny themselves, if I could put a smile on their face, it makes me feel good. That's great. But you can't see me, but I have a smile on my face, just to, as a note. Um, what advice would you like to leave for the next generation that watches you in your oral history, your 
your kids, your grandkids, your great grandchildren? Um, any advice you'd like to leave? I think the big thing, and this is kind of uh, not something new that I'm saying, is pass it forward. You know, don't don't. You know, it's okay that you thank me that you have a positive attitude towards what I've accomplished and how I've helped you individually, but it's your job now to pass the love and the good things that I've shared with you and pass it forward to your friends, to your family, and to future generations. That's great. So, do you have any questions that we, uh, or any comments you want to make that we missed that you want to say, or you feel good about? Oh, the interview? let me think. Let me think. Um, I, 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 yes, a little, a little bit, like elaborating on something. You know, I've had my share of down moments, but um, I realize that's all part of the plan. That um, that we. You know, that Judaism, a great extent studying Judaism, is studying a world of polar opposites. That if there was an evil, good wouldn't be so good. And so, I even, uh, I wouldn't say cherish, but appreciate my teenage years where I withdrew. And my only uh, solace was that I realized that in order to succeed in the world, I think I got this from my grandfather and grandmother, is that education was going to be a positive thing. I think I also realized selfishly that if the longer you went to school, uh, the more time you had before you had to grow up. And so, uh, you know, who wants to grow up? You know, even at this point in our lives, who wants to really grow up? Uh, you know, I think that uh, my good friends, most of them, have done a good job at, at trying not to grow up even when they're grown up. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with everything that's happened in my life. Fabulous. Well, if there's nothing else, uh, then I want to say thank you for joining us for Dallas Jewish Historical Society Oral History. Judge Watt, Chief. Howie, my friend, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mitch.